All right, well, let's go ahead and get started. I think we have a couple more people that are still coming on, but we'll go ahead and start, and uh, they'll, they'll be able to join in when they get in here. Um, good evening, everybody. Thanks for joining us. My name is Brian Sanderoff. I see many people online that I know and a few names that I don't recognize, so welcome to the new people. Um, just in the, in the way of a little bit of background, I'm a traditionally trained, uh, you know, Western pharmacist. I used to stand behind the counter and do that count poor lick stick type and gripe thing that us pharmacists do. And at some point in my career, I came to realize that I really wasn't helping people the way I wanted to just by giving them prescription medicines. And in fact, those medicines for the chronic diseases weren't really helping anybody. All they were doing was turning down the volume on what the body's saying. And the um, analogy I always like to give people is, is that, you know, if you're driving around in your car and you see that little red oil light on the dashboard come up, you have a couple choices. If you want, you take that to take the car to the mechanic and find out what's wrong and get it fixed. Or if not, you can just take a piece of black tape and put it over the light and you don't see it anymore. And unfortunately, in medicine for chronic diseases, that's what we do, including what we're going to be talking about tonight, which is allergies. And so I'm all about trying to understand what the body's really saying with these mm, symptoms that we call diseases. And, uh, and that's what we're going to discuss tonight. Just a few ground rules. Um, I have everybody on mute because with so many people online, it gets very difficult to um, have a conversation and for people to you know, ask their questions verbally. But that doesn't mean you can't uh, participate and ask questions. And actually, I encourage that. And so there's that little question box in your control panel. And all you got to do is type it in there. I'll see it and I will respond to it um, when it's appropriate within the, um, within the webinar tonight. I also would like to tell you that I am always available for questions, and there's many different ways to get in touch with me. Easiest thing is just go to the website, wellbeinggps.com, and give me a call or shoot me an email. If you have specific questions that you don't want to discuss in front of the rest of the crew that's you know here tonight or you know something specific that's not on this topic, but you have a question, then please don't hesitate to call me. Um, part of my mission in life is to act as a resource for the public to be able to answer questions like that. And so I encourage you to do that. And I have gotten calls from many of you that are here tonight um, in the past. Also want to tell you that the webinars that I do are recorded and they end up on the archive on our website as well. I've got a really nice section there with all of the the past webinars that we've done, and this one will be no different. So within a few days, the recording of this, along with the PowerPoint presentation that goes along with it, will be available for you to share with other people. If you like this information, you feel like it's good information, you want to share it, then please, by all means, ask people to do that. I'll also tell you that I usually do each webinar live twice. And so this exact same webinar I will be doing live on Thursday at 12 noon Eastern time. And so you are um, certainly welcome to share that information. People can sign up for it just by going to our website, going to the webinar section and, um, and signing up. So I think that's all the housekeeping stuff I have to do. So I'd love to get started. And again, if you have questions, just punch them right into that little question section there and I'll be able to see it and respond to it. So i um, just curious out there. Anybody suffering from allergies? I say that sort of tongue in cheek because this is a, this has at least in, you know, in the uh, mid Atlantic states, this has been a pretty rough um, allergy season so far. And so what I'm going to do tonight is go through what's really happening with allergies, how we want to treat it in medicine and how there are different ways to address that and the proper ways to both prevent and treat allergies and allergy symptoms. Uh, let me apologize in advance as I always do because sometimes these get a little bit um, technical and you know I think it's important for everybody to understand exactly how uh, the body works and especially in relation to immune function which allergies are part of. Allergies are really just a, uh, an overzealous immune response and we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, as we go forward. So um, again, I apologize for being a little bit technical, but that biochemistry is important to understand if we're going to know how to treat things a little bit differently. All right, good. So here we get started. So according to medicine, this is traditional medicine now, 
If there's something wrong with you, there's one of two things that are going on. Either you've got some sort of invader from the outside world, or you have some sort of chemical imbalance. And it really is that simple when it comes to medicine. It's just one of those two things. So let's take the invader part at first. So what that's saying is basically there's something inside of you from the outside world that needs to be killed. It could be a bacteria, a virus, a cancer, uh, you know, uh, um, any sort of fungus. And we use either antibiotics or antivirals or antifungals or we use chemotherapy or we'll use surgery to cut it out. Or the other thing that could be wrong with you is that you can have some sort of chemical imbalance. And to fix it, all we have to do is balance that chemistry. Again, only slightly simplified, really, with Western medicine, something wrong with you is one of these two things. So what, be, what would be some examples of the chemical imbalances? Well, um, let's say you have depression. From Western medicine perspective, what that means is that you don't have enough of a very specific brain chemical called serotonin. And so all we have to do is adjust it. And so you can take a medicine like Prozac, you know, in my business, we call that vitamin P. And um, you take it and it helps raise your serotonin levels and your, you know, your problems are fixed and you're no longer depressed. Or another example would be reflux. Of course, with that, you have too much acid and you want to take an antacid. Or you may have something like allergies, which is saying that you have too much of what chemical? Histamine. And all we got to do is take an antihistamine and the allergies are cured. I also want to go over real quickly about the immune system. You know, there's two ways that the immune system can work. There's the cell mediated part of the immune system. And what that means is that you've got specific cells that are, um, are designed to kill any sort of invader in the world. And so these are non-specific ways. So let's say a bacteria comes into your body and it doesn't belong there, then the cell mediated response would be your white blood cells would go and find it and, you know, uh, beat it up or, you know, uh, exhibit chemical warfare on it and, and destroy it and get rid of it. The other kind of, the other part of the immune system is called the humoral immune system. And this is where the body creates a defense against a specific invader or a toxin or a trigger. And that's the part of the immune system that is at play when we're talking about allergies. So here's what happens in immune, um, you know, function in regard to allergies, okay? The first thing that happens is you get exposure to a quote-unquote trigger. And that trigger could be, you know, a, a million different things. It could be um, pollen or dander or dust or dust mites or grass or mold or, you know, different components of foods that we can have allergies to. These are triggers. And basically a trigger is something that the body is recognizing as a foreigner. It doesn't belong here. And then what happens is the body will create a specific immunoglobulin that is very specific to that trigger. Again, this is part of the humoral immune system now, okay? Then you'll get a second exposure to that trigger, whatever it is, and now the body is prepared, sort of pre-armed even, so to speak, to, to handle it. And what happens is those... Um, uh, antibodies or those uh, immunoglobulins will activate mast cells, and then the mast cells will release histamine. And then histamine has some effects on the body that I'll talk about in a second. Okay, so you get exposed to the trigger for the first time, the body creates a defense against that particular trigger. Let's say it's a pollen, let's say it's a tree pollen, then you get exposed to it again, and the body is primed to fight against it. And the way it fights against it is that immunoglobulin, which is, um, you know, uh, an antibody, uh, reacts on the cell membrane of a mast cell, and that causes the process where histamine is released. And so here's sort of a pictorial of that. Um, you know, there's your, your mast cell, and these are your antibodies, these Ig E receptors that are on the mast cells that happen, the body made because of a, a previous exposure to whatever the toxin is. Here it's called an antigen. And then that antigen attaches to the, the immunoglobulin, that IgE uh, molecule, and that causes the release of histamine. Also, that, again, that process is called degranulization. And so, um, uh, so histamine is then released. 
So what is histamine? What does it do? And, um, you know, what, what's its purpose? Well, first of all, it's important to know that it is a neurotransmitter that has a lot of function in the body. I, I find this really interesting because this fact often gets missed. If you go to the average Joe on the street and say, hey, what is histamine? They'll say, oh, that's that thing that happens when you have an allergy. And histamine is a very important neurotransmitter. Um, it's also a mediator of inflammation. And that's part of what happens. Again, with immune function, the body uses inflammation as the signal that something's not right and it needs to be fixed. It needs to be looked at or paid attention to. And so histamine is a very important mediator of um, inflammation. And, and there are other, other mediators of inflammation that will happen or that will be at play here as well. Um, what histamine does is it cause alteration, causes alterations in the normal physiological function of the body. And there are some pretty specific ones. It causes dilation of blood vessels and increased permeability of those blood vessels. Now, these two are designed to allow for immune factors to come to the area to do their thing. So you have an assault from something from the outside world. The body has recognized it as a foreigner. It releases histamine, and then histamine causes dilation of blood vessels, increased permeability of those blood vessels so that the, the immune factors that are in the blood vessels can leak through the, uh, you know, the, the walls of the blood vessels into the space in between so that it can, you know, take care of whatever that invader is. The other thing that happens is it causes smooth muscle constriction. Now, again, this, this is life-saving potentially. This is designed to allow for restricting exposure. So imagine that you breathe in something that is a toxin. Maybe you're in an environment where there's a, you know, something uh, in the air and you breathe it in and it's basically toxic to the body. One of the responses through this whole mechanism that I just mentioned is constriction of um, smooth muscle. Well, your airways are a smooth muscle and the body is attempting to not allow any more of whatever that chemical is into the body. So it constricts those blood vessels, those uh, breathing tubes, those airways to stop further exposure to happen. Ultimately, again, that's life-saving. It's homeostasis in action. Um, but this can be carried to an extreme. And we've all heard of people who have had what's known as anaphylaxis in response to allergies. And what that means is everything completely closes down. And of course, that can be a bad thing when those airways close down so you can't get any air either. So these changes in physiology as a result of histamine being released cause the hallmark symptoms of allergies. And all of you guys know this, runny nose, sneezing, watery eyes, coughing, increased mucus, all of these are a result of those physiological changes that are happening. So how do antihistamines work? You know, you go into the uh, drugstore and you go into that aisle and there are millions of products that are available to help treat allergies. And that's evidence of two things. One, lots of money is made on that. And number two, a lot of people suffer from allergies. And truth is you can't watch primetime television this time of year without seeing multiple commercials for allergy medicines, antihistamines. And so what they do is they block the effect on the blood vessels and the smooth muscle of histamine. So they, you know, they actually go to those receptor sites that would cause those changes and they set up a blockade so that histamine cannot, uh, you know, make that, uh, that change, cause that physio physiology to change. Um, I also want to point out that there are different kinds of histamine receptors within the body. And this is a key thing to understand. And in my opinion, one of the shortcomings that happens with um, Western medicine, because we have a tendency to look at one chemical and one action of that chemical in the body and think that that's all there is. So there's four different histamine receptors within the body. There's H1 receptors, histamine 1 receptors, and those are in the lungs, the throat, the nose, the mouth, the skin. And those are the ones that really do affect the mast cells the way that I just talked about. H2 receptors, histamine 2 receptors are in the stomach, and that is responsible for helping with the production of acid. And so those medicines that cut down on acid in the stomach, like Zantec or Prilosec, those kinds of things, they affect the histamine um, uh, receptor there, the H2. H3 receptors are in the central nervous system. H4 receptors are in immune cells. And so understanding 
how histamine works in the body and all its effects in the body helps you also understand the side effects that you can get from taking antihistamines. And of course, the most common one is energy. People take antihistamines and they get sleepy. Benadryl is probably the, you know, the, the first one on the market and the one that still is most effective as far as the pharmaceuticals go, um, but it has a side effect that makes you drowsy. Now, the pharmaceutical industry and its you know, clever wisdom actually takes advantage of that fact. And if you look at sleeping medicines, you'll see that many of them actually are this antihistamine, diphenhydramine, which you know, can make you drowsy. So um, what are the other effects of histamine? Well, as I just mentioned, it plays a role with sleep regulation. It plays a role with an appropriate response to stress, acid production in the stomach, how memory and learning actually work within your brain, even erectile function in men. And so all of these things can get affected when you're taking an antihistamine. And that's where you get these side effects from and you know, what we consider the negative side effects of taking these antihistamines to try to you know, uh, treat your allergies. And um, it, it, again, this is where medicine, I think, always makes a mistake because they assume – they don't take a holistic approach. They don't look at the whole body. And then here's a great example of it. They look at histamine and they see histamine's role in the, um, the formation of allergy symptoms. And they think, okay, if we cut it out, then we'll cut out the allergy symptoms without understanding the true biochemistry of histamine in the body and all these other functions that it has as a very important neurochemical. And so um, that, that's where the side effects come from, from uh, the medicines, right? Okay, so uh, I just want to say that this is important to understand. Allergies are nothing more than an overzealous inflammatory response. If we just keep that in mind, if we just understand that and understand the roots of that overreaction, that overzealousness, then we can prevent and treat allergies in a completely different way that don't cause side effects and you know normalize the body's function to where it should be. That makes sense, right? Um, don't forget if you have questions. If I'm going through something and uh, you know you have a question, then just type it in there, and I will I will see it in a little box and I will respond to it. I haven't seen any questions yet. Just making sure. So um, what are the factors that are leading to this inappropriate uh, inflammation? Genetics can play a role with this. There's no question about that. We can have a genetic predisposition towards inappropriate or overzealous inflammation. And I'll also tell you that here we are talking about allergies. But as I always point out in these webinars and when I'm talking to people, that inflammation is one of the key underpinnings to chronic disease and aging. And so if you have this tendency, it could show up as allergies, but it also could show up as a tendency to suffer from any one of the chronic diseases that our parents could suffer from. So genetics definitely do, do play a role, but I will tell you that the bigger factor here is the imbalance of fats in your diet. And this imbalance of fats leads to inappropriate inflammatory response. So here's the story. I've gone over it before. I love to go over it because it's so important to understand, and we all need to keep this in mind. So there are two kinds of fats. There are pro-inflammatory fats, and there are anti-inflammatory fats. Pro-inflammatory fats, also known as omega-6s, they lead to inflammation. And anti-inflammatory fats, also known as omega-3s, work against inflammation. Both of them are important. Pro-inflammatory fats, if you didn't have them in your body, your body's immune system wouldn't work. Your body's ability to recognize self from non-self wouldn't be there. And you would quickly die. But nature intended there to be a certain ratio of pro to anti-inflammatory fats in our diet. That What's that ratio? One to one, anywhere from one to one to two to one. And for the vast majority of the time that we have been on this planet, the foods that we've eaten have supplied us with that ratio of a one-to-one -to, -one to two to one ratio of pro to anti-inflammatory fats. What is it in the standard American diet? Anywhere from 15 to 30 to one pro to anti-inflammatory. It's out of balance. 
Why is that? Well, it's because two things. One, we get entirely too many omega-6 fatty acids in our diet. Those omega-6s come from vegetable oils like sunflower, safflower, canola, all of those things. You know, somewhere back uh, 60, 70 years ago, we realized that if we cook these foods in these oils, they get nice and crispy and they just taste so good and we just can't get them out of our diet. And we don't get enough of the omega-3s, which come from cold Atlantic fish, fish oil. They come from other foods as well. The fact is, is that if an animal eats the way it was intended to eat in nature, its fats will be in this same balance, the proper balance of anywhere from a one to one to two to one ratio. So if you were to go out and catch a deer or a rabbit and eat it, it would give you balanced fats. But when you eat beef and chicken that have been fed differently than they would eat in nature, their fats change. And so the cows that most of us eat, the beef that we eat, has been fed corn. What's in corn? Corn oil. What does that do to the fats that are in that animal? It changes the fats to be more out of balance, more omega-6s, more pro-inflammatory fats, and less omega-3s, anti-inflammatory fats. And same thing with all of our animal stock. And today, even farmed fish like salmon is starting to show a out of balance ratio of healthy fats in it or fats in it. And that's because, you know, we feed it Purina salmon chow instead of what it would eat in nature. And so this is, this is how that happened. And so how do we get back to that? We got to change the fats in our diet. So you can change your diet and say, all right, I'm not going to have as many vegetable fats and I'm going to eat more of the, you know, the, the fats from, uh, from cold Atlantic fish, you know, salmon, tuna, herring, um, uh, and then also uh, cut down on the vegetable fats and, you know, eat animals that have been fed the way they're supposed to. So I'm talking about uh, meat and chicken that come from uh, range-free animals, you know, that are out eating grass. It's more expensive. You know why? Because it takes a cow two and a half years to get to market weight when it's eating grass and it only takes nine months when it's eating corn. That's why we started feeding it corn. Um, so that's one of the ways to do it. As we're going to talk about a little bit later, supplementing with it as well is probably the easier way to do it, supplementing with uh, healthy fats. I'm talking about fish oil, right? So I want to say that exposure to pollen is not a life-threatening event, but your body may very well react like it is, and that's because of that out-of-balance inflammatory response. Another way to think of it is that, you know, let's say you lit a match and you wanted to put that out. You could just blow it out. Just blow it out. Or if you want, you could call the fire department and they'll come and put it out for you. That's what your body does. Instead of just taking care of a minor trigger, it sets off the alarms and calls in the big boys. And that's why we get the response that we do. And ultimately, that's called allergies. Okay, I also want to say a quick word about our environment. You know, we live in cooperation with many organisms on this planet. And we are designed to interact with them in certain ways. And our desire to live in a completely sterile environment is a bad idea. What are the effects of trying to do that? Our immune system doesn't get exercise. It doesn't get practice in dealing with small assaults. And so then what happens is when it gets something in the body, it goes nuts. Again, all the alarms go off. And so, you know, this idea of antibacterial soap and antibacterial clothes and, you know, scrubbing our, our fruits and vegetables with, um, with bleach and not letting our kids go out and play in the dirt. It's a huge mistake that we make. And that's something that needs to change. We need to be better about realizing that we're supposed to live in sync with, with nature. And one of the reasons for the proliferation of allergies is this exact um, issue. Um, I also want to talk about another dietary concern that does affect allergies in a negative way, and that is dairy. Now, here's the story. Number one, please realize that we are the only animal in the entire animal kingdom that voluntarily drinks the milk of a different animal. I've had people tell me, no, cats drink milk. You know, that's because we give it to the cats. The rest of the animals on this planet, they drink the milk of their own animal and they only drink milk until they've been weaned. And we make this mistake. We think that, you know, the milk from a different animal is actually good for us and it's not. There are differences in proteins that are supplied 
from those other animals. And so for dairy, cow's milk in particular, it has whey and it has casein, but the kind of casein that comes from many dairy cows is a form that the human body is not exposed to naturally, meaning that's not in mother's milk, human mother's milk. And the human body does not have the ability to break it down. Think about that for a second. We do not have the ability to break that protein down properly. Then that foreign protein gets absorbed into our system, and it's one of those things that our body says, oh, that doesn't belong here, and it puts into play this whole cascade of events that leads to all of these allergies. It also creates all sorts of mucus. Ever go into a Baskin-Robbins? You always see a water fountain there. You know why that is? Because you eat ice cream, and then you want to wash all that mucus away. And that mucus is in result to this foreign protein that the body doesn't have the ability to break down, the human body. It's great for cows. I'm sure cows would love ice cream and they wouldn't need water. But for us humans, we shouldn't do that. And so it's part of what lays the groundwork that creates the environment that makes allergies worse or sometimes even just possible in the first place. And I also want to talk about the result of pasteurization because we pasteurize our milk. What that means is we heat it. Now, the reason we do it is because we don't want to get certain bacteria from the milk. Well, I have to say that in nature, if cows were allowed to live the way they were supposed to, instead of in pens, overcrowded, walking around in their own feces, they wouldn't become the harbingers of all these negative bacteria that we have to kill with pasteurization. But when we heat milk, we destroy the enzymes that are in that milk. And when that happens, we destroy the ability to break that protein down. We don't have that ability ourselves. If you were drinking milk right out of the cow, the enzymes to break that specific kind of casein down would be there, and it wouldn't be as much of a problem. But I don't know how it is. I know, you know I've got some people here that are listening um, around the country. Here in Maryland, it's actually illegal to share raw milk. You can't, you know, you can own a cow and you can use the milk from that cow yourself. But if you give that milk raw to somebody else, you're actually breaking the law. And it's illegal to have a cow share here, which means, you know, 20 people getting together and owning a cow so that they can all share in the milk. Um, can't do it. I think there's a there's a financial uh, part of that as well. OK, so uh, that's the dairy thing. And so if you do have chronic allergies especially this time of year, you get off of dairy, I can almost guarantee you that your allergies will improve. Um, another potential dietary issue that I would be remiss if I didn't mention with this is about hidden food sensitivities. So I want to point out that a food sensitivity and a food allergy are two different things. We all know of somebody who has an extreme allergy to something like peanuts. In fact, we all know that that's much more common today than it was 10 years ago or 20 or 30 or 40. You know, now you can have some kids who are in a room with somebody whose cousin was thinking about peanuts and they'll react to it. That's how out of control this whole allergy thing has become. Food sensitivities are a little bit different and they're moderated by a different immunoglobulin. The ones that give us allergies that are those immediate response where the histamine is released and all that kind of stuff are called IgE. And hidden food sensitivities come from immune uh, immunoglobulins that are called IgG. They can be measured differently in blood tests. I'm not sure how accurate that is, but it's a, it's a whole different thing. So it doesn't, it doesn't um, necessarily involve mast cells and histamine. And these IgG uh, immunoglobulins can affect any tissue or any organ or any system in the body. And so people can have hidden food sensitivities like to something like gluten, and the result can be gut dysfunction or brain fog or migraine headaches or hormonal disturbances or, you know, any one of the chronic diseases that we could suffer from as we get older. So I wanted to talk about that as well. And the solution to that uh, can be somewhat different. This is also an immune, uh, you know, an immune response, and it's also an inflammatory response. So as far as balancing the fats and all that kind of stuff, that can be helpful. But then there's also other issues at, at play here, including gut function, digestion, uh, all that sort of stuff. But I wanted to make sure I mentioned it because that would be important. Um, so some other lifestyle considerations. N number one, smoking. And, you know, I, I, 
I say it, and every time I say it, I, and I do one of these webinars, I say, I shouldn't have to say this anymore. Everybody has got to know that smoking is not good for you. And obviously, if you've got allergies, number one, it has a terrible effect on the immune system. And that's a bad thing, right? Um, and uh, number two, um, it, it's putting toxins into your body. That's something else to react to. And so if you're smoking, quit smoking. And if you are smoking, stop wasting time and effort trying to do other things that aren't going to be as important in helping you with your chronic health. I mean, what I'm saying is don't say to yourself, okay, fish oil is really important. So I'm just going to use fish oil and I'm going to keep smoking. Far and away, smoking is the biggest straw on this camel's back. And that's the one that you should start working on first. And I really do encourage you to do that. Sorry, I had a question here that uh, that I didn't see come in. I think I probably answered it, but just let me read it anyway. This is from Nanda, and it said, uh, is raw cow's milk better? And yes, the answer is yes, it is better. And it's better because um, uh, because it has the enzymes in it that are, um, uh, you know, to help break that protein down. And sorry, I messed up my um, my presentation here. Let me see where I was. Okay, so smoking. Uh, and thanks for that, that question. I appreciate it. Um, okay. So the next thing is immune function and things that affect immune function negatively um, need to be looked at. So I'm talking about stress and sleep. Um, anything that makes the immune system not work properly or not um, or get distracted is something that's going to contribute to allergies being worse. Because, again, this is an overzealous inflammatory and immune response. OK, so if you have allergies, you may think, wow, stress has nothing to do with it. And it does. And studies have shown that people that are under stress suffer more from allergies and people that don't sleep properly suffer more from allergies. So pay attention to that and, and get that under control because that will play a role with your chronic allergies as well. Exercise is really, really important. One, because it has a positive effect on the immune system. Studies have shown that um, uh, children who are active are half as likely to be allergic to hay fever you know, to have hay fever than children that are sedentary. And it's because, and, and it's funny because you'd think just the opposite because children that are more active are likely going to be outside and get exposed even more to, um, you know, the things that cause hay fever, the pollens or grasses or whatever. And, um, and it's just the opposite. So exercise is really, really important and should be, um, you know, should be uh, paid attention to. Um, okay. So another question, and that is, uh, what about almond milk? And that's a good question as well. And almond milk is um, uh, is fine. And, you know, it's not dairy. It's not coming from cows. And so um, uh, almond milk, rice milk, I'm not so crazy about soy. So I don't, I don't put soy milk in there. Uh, but rice milk, almond milk, potato milk, um, hemp milk even. Um, nothing funky happens when you drink hemp milk, just saying. And, um, and, uh, and so all those are good, you know, uh, replacements for anything that you know, that you would need dairy for in cooking or whatever. Uh, we make quiche here at my house and we use uh, almond milk for that and it works great. Um, okay, uh, what else do we got there? And then um, uh, exposure to pollen is something to sort of pay attention to. If pollen is the problem, realize that, um, that pollen is most prevalent earlier in the morning before 10 p.m. I mean 10 a.m. Sorry. So if you've got your windows open, uh, don't have them open in the morning. If you're driving to work and you've got your windows open and it's you know eight o'clock in the morning, close them because you're getting more exposure to pollen that way. Um, uh, if you're going to do work outside in the yard on the weekends, wait till after 10. Your exposure to the pollen will be much less. And I also wrote down their website, pollen.com. If you go there, you can type in your um, your zip code, and it'll tell you what the pollen count is expected to be over the next four days in your area. And so you'll know when it's going to be, you know, more of an issue. Obviously, cutting down on exposure to that could be helpful. Um, okay, so I also want to talk about the underlying environment of the sinuses because oftentimes we have a fungus that lives in our sinuses. And that fungus, again, just like exposure to dairy, is one of those underlying issues that creates the conditions that makes allergies worse. And so treating that 
fungus in the sinuses can be very helpful. And people that have chronic sinus infections, they'll get put on antibiotics and it appears to make the problem better. But actually being on that antibiotic and destroying the good bacteria in the gut makes it more likely for the fungus to be able to grow in the gut and then in the sinuses, which then makes the problems worse. And so I have a lot of patients with experience having you know, multiple antibiotics for sinus infections and their sinus infections get worse, they last longer, they get it more frequently. Um, and so doing something to kill that fungus inside the sinuses is probably a good idea. So has anyone ever heard of a neti pot? I know some of, the, some of you guys out there have used them, right? And uh, um, you can raise your hands if you do that. You can click on your little raise hand and then I would see that you do or have used a neti pot before. Um, so here's a little picture of a neti pot in action. So it looks like a little genie's lamp, or at least those are the ones that I've seen most often. And, um, and uh, what you do is you fill it with water and a saline solution. Um, that saline solution is, you know, to match the osmolarity of your body tissue so that it's not irritating to use that. And then you put the business end of it, you fill it up with that water, warm water, and then you put the business end of it in your nostril and then you tilt your head and you tilt it up. And as you can see in that little picture, the water goes in that nostril through the frontal sinuses and then out of the other nostril. And this can be tremendously cleansing for your sinuses and make your allergies much, much better. And this is the kind of thing that I do in the morning when I'm in the shower because, you know, obviously you can do that and then you can shower. You don't have to worry about the mess that you're making. And it works really, really well. And I put grapefruit seed extract down there because, and again, it's grapefruit seed extract, not grape seed extract. Grapefruit seed extract is antibacterial, antiviral, and most importantly, it's antifungal. So you, couple, you take a five or six drops of that and you put it in your neti pot when you use it, then you're flushing through your sinuses, something that helps kill the fungus. And oh, you'll breathe like you've never breathed before. So I do encourage you to do that. Taking care of your sinuses is very important for allergies as well. And let's see, another question. It is a good idea to use saline drops in nose on a daily basis as well. Is it a good idea? And yes, because one of the other underlying conditions that makes the sinuses more susceptible to having these problems is dryness. Now, the truth is, is that if you're taking fish oil as a supplement, that's going to help um, you know, that's going to help moisturize properly from the inside out the way nature intended. And having dry sinuses will be less of a problem. But think about this. In the winter, what do we do in our houses? We use dry heat and that dries out everything in our body. And then we hit the spring and everything's all dry and our mucous membranes are dry and they're clogged because of the dairy and blah, blah, blah. And then we're much more susceptible to allergies. And so trying to avoid those um, you know, those habits are a good idea. So yes, using saline drops are great or using the, the neti bot like I talked about as well. Thanks for that question. I appreciate it. Um, okay, so let's talk about some supplements in regards to prevention. Um, you know I'm going to say it, fish oil, very, very important. This is the thing to do to balance your fats, to balance your inflammatory response. And this is key. To cutting down. Now, it's not like, all right, I'm going to take my fish oil and tomorrow I'm not going to have allergies anymore. It takes a while to sort of refill that reservoir of healthy anti-inflammatory fats and to balance your diet. There are different products out there on the market. I recommend uh, a bunch of different ones. The one I like the most often, the one I use personally and the one I use that I like the most is called Whole Mega by a company called New Chapter. Um, I like it because they don't concentrate the fish oil to just certain fats like EPA and DHA, like almost every other product out there does. They, it's more like a whole food uh, supplement, a whole food treated supplement. And so it has a full array of all the omega fats that are in fish oil and it's 15 different ones. And um, this product has also been shown by study on this particular product, even Jeff, just after a two gram dose. To, inf you know, to show integration into cell membranes, to lower LDL, raise HDL, lower triglycerides, to make cells communicate with each other, and to lower C-reactive protein, which is a measure of what? Inflammation. And so that really is the best product out there. I will tell you that we are very aggressive with our pricing. And so I would encourage you to get on the website, check it out, you know, and then compare. You're not going to find it any cheaper anywhere else. And four capsules a day, two with breakfast and two with dinner. If swallowing capsules is not your gig, then there are all sorts of fish oil liquids out there, and I recommend the one by Wellbeing. It's our own brand. 
and it's a mild lemon flavor to it, kind of lemon lime. It does not taste fishy at all. And we have a lot of good experience with that, with kids being willing to take it, including my ever so adorable one-year-old granddaughter, Ayla, who takes it off the spoon and doesn't complain about it at all. So that's number one, fish oil. Number two, probiotics. Good bacteria play a very important role. And studies have shown that when you have a dysbiosis, when you have an imbalance of bacteria in your gut, you're more likely to suffer from allergies. And maybe part of it has to do with that whole fungal thing that I told you about. Because when you don't have the good guys in the neighborhood, then bad guys overgrow, including yeast. And then once that overgrows in your gut, then it shows up somewhere else in your body. And for many of us, it's in our sinuses. So taking a good probiotic as far as a product, um, I like the, the product that's called Probiotic by a company called Healthy Origins. The reason I like it is multi-strain formula, very, very potent. It has 30 billion bacteria per capsule, and it's completely shelf-stable. And I've seen other products that are shelf-stable, and they'll say 30 billion bacteria at time of manufacture. Well, you know what? There's die-off that happens. And so, you know, it could take quite a while to get from the manufacturer to the wholesaler to the retailer to you. And by that time, there may not be anything live in that capsule anymore. With the probiotic one, with the Healthy Origins probiotic product, it's 30 billion at time of expiration, guaranteed. And I've seen the studies to prove it. So that means that, that there's actually quite a bit more in there. And then, you know, there's sort of a regular die-off that happens. And so even if you were to take it on the very last day of, you know, it being good, you would still get 30 billion bacteria per capsule. And so it's a great product. It's shelf-stable. You don't have to put it in the uh, refrigerator, so it's easy to remember to take. Third thing is vitamin D. And again, uh, I've got a webinar about this on the archive. If you have not listened to it, I would encourage you to go and listen to it. Um, vitamin D is so important for your immune function. And so any malady that is immune-centered, um, vitamin D is going to be helpful for. And I recommend 5,000 units a day starting a couple months before. I mean, I oftentimes recommend this throughout this winter as well because it helps with cold and flu and that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, if you're taking it just in respect to allergies, starting a little bit, um, you know, a month or two before the allergy season hits, um, then you'll start to prepare your body a little bit uh, more efficiently. 5,000 international units and make sure it's vitamin D3, which is the natural D. Um, you know, that's the one that your body uses most efficiently. And studies have shown that people that suffer from allergies have a tendency to have lower vitamin D levels than people that don't suffer from allergies. Okay. How about supplements to take for treatment? How about things that are sort of natural antihistamines? Well, there's a bioflavonoid that's called quercetin. Um, natural sources of quercetin would come from apples and from black tea, actually. And so this is known to stabilize mast cells. And so it's not really an antihistamine. It's not blocking the effect of antihistamine. It is stabilizing the mast cells so they're less likely to, to degranulate where that uh, histamine gets released. And so um, quercetin is best taken, and you'll almost always see it in formulas with vitamin C and bromelain as well. It just makes your body be able to use and absorb the quercetin more uh, effectively. Stinging nettle is an herb that has a long historical use for allergies. It's anti-inflammatory. You also see it oftentimes in prostate formulas because it's anti-inflammatory. So again, it's not monkeying with biochemistry in blocking histamine and its effects. So you're not going to get any side effects from this like you would from an antihistamine. And what it does is it kind of calms the inflammatory response like fish oil does. Uh, it does it in a different way from an herbal approach, and it's very, very effective. Products that have freeze-dried stinging nettle in it have a tendency to work better. Not sure why that is, but studies have shown that the freeze-dried stinging nettle works better. Um, and then there's all sorts of other herbs that are anti-inflammatory, turmeric and ginger. Uh, there are herbs that help open up the sinuses and allow things to drain better, like, um, like wasabi even. So there are some specific formulas that I use a lot that are, you know, again, we sort of think of them as natural antihistamines, but they're not really, they're not really, you know, blocking histamine effect. They're making the body function more appropriately. My two favorites, one of them is called Aller 7 Support, and that's under our own label. And that actually is an award-winning formula, a very unique, unique combination of herbs, including quercetin and stinging nettle, that has been very, very effective in helping people suffer less from allergies. And then uh, my other favorite formula is one by 
um, a company called Orthomolecular called Natural Dehist. This is one that I've used for probably 10, 12 years in my practice. And I can't tell you the, the kind of feedback I get from people with, um, you know, what kind of results they get. So let's take a scenario like, you know, you're a pretty bad allergy sufferer and you're on, you know, Claritin and you're on Nasonex, you know, which is a steroid um, nasal inhalant um, because of how bad the allergy season is for you. Um, then uh, the proper thing to do is get on proper dosage of fish oil, um, make sure you're getting your vitamin D, Next time you get your blood test, get your vitamin D level checked as well, so we know that it's an appropriate, you know, that it's appropriate. Um, uh, you know, make sure that your gut is functioning properly. Probiotic, good idea. Um, get on one of these formulas, like the natural dehist. Give it about ten days of doing that, plus whatever medicines you're taking, and then see how you're feeling. And if you really feel good allergy-wise. That's when you start to maybe cut down on that Claritin or Benadryl and see if you really need it. And oftentimes, doing these things will eliminate the need for those other medicines. And then you just won't need them anymore. Something I didn't mention in that scenario, which I have to mention, I, <laughs> I met with a patient this afternoon before I left the, left the office. When I told him this bit of news, he was not happy um, about that. And that is that you got to get off of dairy also. I cannot tell you how much of a problem that is in all sorts of ways in your body, including allergies. So if you suffer from allergies, get on your fish oil, your vitamin D, your probiotic, get off of dairy, and your life is going to be completely different. Got another question coming in here, and that is, I have come to the conclusion that eating what is natural in your ethnicity is the best way to control weight, allergies, et cetera. Also, to use non-dairy milk products and to throw in probiotics, fish oils, and the other good stuff you mentioned, simplify. Wow. Thank you, Nanda. I appreciate that. And uh, if you had said that in the beginning, I wouldn't have had to do the uh, the webinar. <laughs> we could have gotten out of here early. Just kidding. But I do appreciate that. That is, uh, that is de definitely helpful. And it's definitely uh, my belief as well. We do things that go against nature and how nature intended for us to live in sync with it. And the result of that are all of these chronic diseases that we suffer with, including allergies. So, um, okay. Upcoming webinars. Next month is going to be osteoporosis. Month after that, sports nutrition, and then dealing with menopause in August. Uh, I'll also tell you that uh, I'm I'm now adding things to the schedule, and so you may find me um, like I did last week doing a webinar um, that is off the schedule about something that is you know topical and important to to you know educate people about as well. And so last week I did a a, a webinar about uh, internal cleansing. And detoxing in a you know about a program that we detox with. So, anyways, that's what's coming up. I encourage you to share that information with other people as well. And I uh, do love your feedback. And also want to tell you that again, in our archives on the website, wellbeinggps.com, um, all of our past web webinars are on there, including a vitamin D one, stress, weight loss, um, cholesterol. Um, the cleansing one I talked about, I'm going to be recording one called the essential six. I know I keep saying that every week, um, uh, pretty soon, which goes through what I think are the six supplements that everybody should be on. Um, and, and the reasons why I really talk about that, you know, I teach a course at Hopkins, uh, on anti-aging, a holistic approach to anti-aging. And the first thing I say in that course is there's no such thing as anti-aging. If you're not aging, you're dead, but there is such a thing as graceful aging. And there are specific nutrients supplements that can definitely affect genetic expression and our ability to age more gracefully and so that's what that one's about everybody thank you for your participation quite a crowd we have tonight from again from all over the country i really do appreciate it and i appreciate the uh, the feedback um, during the webinar the questions and then um, you know what happens afterwards and don't forget to share this with people as well Everybody, thank you so much. Have a really great evening, and I hope to see you all again.